All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we're going to do a new sutra. Uh, we're still going to be in the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're going to skip over a few more. So tonight, we're going to do sutta number seven, the Vattaha Sutta or the Vatuapama Sutta, the Cloth Sutta, the Vattaha Sutta, or the parable or simile of the cloth, which is this Vatuapama Sutta. So, uh, number seven. <clears throat> so, let's see. Number of things. I, there's a couple of things that I want to tell you about, about the sutra before I do a reading of it. And I'm looking forward to the reading. A couple of things, though, that it, I think will make the reading more enjoyable, if you sort of know this going into it. So this is this is a great sutra, first of all. This is a like this is a classic sutra. This this kind of has it has everything. It's it's got dharma, it's got a story, it's got a upaya, it's got everything. So we're gonna have a lot to discuss, but in order to do that, just a couple of things. So it's called the simile of the cloth, and indeed the Buddha is using a metaphor or a simile in this, which makes it a classic sutra. But I want you to know ahead of time that. In a way, what the simile is about, or what the sutta is about, we're kind of dealing with the concept of defilement and purity. And that's always a tricky topic, like just in the world in general, like conversations about purity and defilement in general are complicated. Within the world of religion, they're particularly complicated. So we're going to be talking about that those two ideas defilement and purity but based upon the sutra and when it comes to defilement in this sense this sutta is sort of particularly about one idea and this is really what i want you to know kind of going into this the buddha is going to be giving us a a kind of a list and this list is going to be things like anger, malice, um, je you know, uh, I don't think jealousy is on here, but basically like deceit. It's going to be a list of 16 different dharmas, different things, mental afflictions. And I just want you to know ahead of time that these 16 things are called the upaklesha. Klesha is our general term for defilement in, in Buddhism. And the kleshas are traditionally like greed, anger, delusion. Raga, dvesha, moha. And those are considered sort of the primary kleshas. There are what are called secondary kleshas, upaklesha. In Pali, I think in, in this sutta, in Pali, it's upakalesa. It's upaklesha in Sanskrit. And these are these sort of, again, they're like secondary defilements. I'm only mentioning this because if you're like a Dharma head, like you're a super Dharma student, if you're familiar with the hundred Dharmas, in particularly, in particular, the hundred dharmas of Vasubandhu. Well, the Upaklesha are a category of the hundred dharmas. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight are these particular 16. So I just want you to know that this is a special category of Klesha that we're dealing with. And other than that, I don't actually think there's anything I need to mention going into this. But again, we'll have a lot to talk about after the reading. So... Uh, kick back, relax. As usual, I'm going to keep some of the repetitions, but I am going to abridge it a little bit and not do all the repetitions. So 
just if you're meaning if you're reading along, you'll notice when I start repeating or when I choose not to. So, so on to the Vatupama Sutta, the simile of the cloth. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's park. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus. Venerable sir, they replied. And the Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus. Suppose a cloth were defiled and stained and a dyer dipped it in some dye or some other, whether blue or yellow or red or carmine. It would look poorly dyed and impure in color. Why is that? Because of the impurity of the cloth. So too, <clears throat> when the mind is defiled, an unhappy destination may be expected. Bhikkhus, suppose a cloth were pure and bright, and a dyer dipped it in some dye or another, whether blue or yellow or red or carmine, it would look well dyed and pure in color. And why is that? Because of the purity of the cloth. So too, when the mind is undefiled, a happy destination may be expected. And what bhikkhus are the chitta upaklesha? What are the imperfections that defile the mind? Covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Ill will is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Anger is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Resentment is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Contempt is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Insolence is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Envy is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Avarice is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Deceit is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Fraud is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Obstinacy is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Rivalry is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Conceit is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Arrogance is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Vanity is an imperfection that defiles the mind. And negligence is an imperfection that defiles the mind. Knowing that covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind, a bhikkhu abandons it. Knowing that ill will, anger, resentment, contempt, insolence, envy, avarice, deceit, fraud, obstinacy, rivalry, conceit, arrogance, vanity, and negligence, knowing that those are all imperfections that defile the mind, a bhikkhu abandons them. When a bhikkhu has known that covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind and has abandoned it, when bhikkhus have known that ill will and anger and resentment and contempt and insolence and envy and avarice and deceit and fraud and obstinacy, rivalry, conceit, arrogancy, vanity, and negligence, when they have known that those are imperfections that defile the mind, and have abandoned them, they acquire unwavering confidence in the Buddha. Like this, they think the Blessed One is accomplished, fully enlightened, 
perfect in true knowledge and conduct, a sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of people to be tamed, teacher of gods and human, humans, enlightened and blessed. They acquire unwavering confidence in the Dhamma. Thus, the Dharma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, visible here and now, immediately effective, inviting inspection, onward leading, to be experienced by the wise for themselves. And they acquire unwavering confidence in the Sangha, like this, thinking, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples they're practicing the good way. They're practicing the straight way, practicing the true way, practicing the proper way. That is, the four pairs of people, laymen, laywomen, monks and nuns, and the eight types of individuals, all of those. This Sangha of the Blessed One's disciple is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings worthy of reverential salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. <clears throat> when one has given up, expelled, released, abandoned, and relinquished those imperfections of the mind, in part, they consider thus, I'm possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha. And they gain inspiration in the meaning. They gain inspiration in the Dharma. They gain gladness connected with the Dharma. And when they are glad, rapture is born. In one whom is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated in samadhi. They consider thus, I'm possessed of unwavering confidence in the Dharma, and they gain inspiration in its meaning, in gain inspiration in the Dharma. They gain gladness connected with the Dharma. And when they are glad, rapture is born. In one who is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated in samadhi. And they consider thus, I am possessed of unwavering confidence in the Sangha, and they gain inspiration in the meaning. They gain inspiration in the Dharma. They gain gladness connected with the Dharma. And when they are glad, rapture is born. In one whom is, whom is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated in samadhi. They consider thus, the imperfections of the mind have in part been given up, expelled, released, abandoned, and relinquished by me. And they gain inspiration in the meaning. They gain inspiration in the Dharma. They gain gladness connected with the Dharma. And when they are glad, rapture is born. In one whom is rapturous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. And one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated in samadhi. Bhikkhus. If a bhikkhu of such virtue as that in such a state of samadhi concentration as that, and with such wisdom. If they were to eat alms food, consisting of choice hill rice, along with various sauces and curries, 
even that would be no obstacle for them. Just as a cloth that is defiled and stained becomes pure and bright with the help of clear water, or just as gold becomes pure and bright with the help of a furnace, so too, if a bhikkhu of such virtue, of such a state of concentration and such wisdom, eats alms food consisting of choice hill rice along with various sauces and curries, even that would be no obstacle for them. And then one abides, pervading one quarter of the directions with a mind imbued with metta, loving kindness. Likewise, the second quarter, the third quarter, and likewise the fourth quarter, and so above and so below, around and everywhere, and to all as oneself. One abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. One abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with karunya, great compassion, and likewise the second, and likewise the third, and likewise the fourth, and so above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as oneself, one abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with great compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. One abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with mudita, empathic or altruistic joy. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above, below, around, and everywhere, and to all as oneself. One abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with empathic joy, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. And one abides, <clears throat> and one abides pervading one quarter with a mind of upeksha, equanimity, and likewise the second, and likewise the third, and likewise the fourth, so above, below, around, everywhere. And to all as oneself, one abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. One understands thus, there is this, there is the inferior, there is the superior, and beyond, there is an escape from this entire field of perception. When one knows and sees thus, the mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire liberated from the taint of being and liberated from the taint of ignorance. And when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. One understands. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming into any state of being. Bhikkhus. This bhikkhu is called one bathed with the inner bathing. Now, on that same occasion, the Brahmin, Sundarika Bahara Devaja, 
was sitting not far from the Blessed One. Then he said to the Blessed One, But doesn't Master Gotama go to the Bahuka River in order to bathe? Why go to the Bahuka River, Brahman? What can the Bahuka River do? Master Gotama, the Bahuka River is held by many to give liberation. It is held by many to give merit. And many wash away their evil actions in the Bahuka River. Then the Blessed One addressed the Brahman Sundarika Bahardavaja in stanzas thus. Bahuka and Adikaka, Gaya and Sundarika too, Hayaga and Sarasati and the stream Bahumati. A fool may there forever bathe, yet will not purify dark deeds. What can the Sundarika bring to pass? What the Payaga? What the Bahuka? They cannot purify an evil doer, a man who has done cruel and brutal deeds. One pure in heart has evermore the feast of spring, Hahuga, the holy day. One fair in act, one pure in heart, brings virtue to perfection. It's here, Brahman, that you should bathe to make yourself a refuge for all beings. And if you speak no falsehood, nor work harm on any living being, nor take what has not been offered, with faith and being free from avarice. What need for you to go to Gaia? For any well will be your Gaia. When this was said, the Brahmin Sundarika Baharadavaja said, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama, Master Gotama has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see. I go to the Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dharma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. I would receive the going forth under Master Gotama. I would receive the full ordination. And the Brahmin Sundarika Baharadavaja received the going forth under the Blessed One, and he received the full admission. And soon, not long after his full admission, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute, the Venerable Baharadavaja, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge here and now, entered upon and abided in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which those rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. He directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming into any state of being. And the venerable Bahara Devaja became one of the Arahats. All right. Lovely little sutta. Like I said, it, it's kind of got a lot. It's got all kinds of stuff going on. So, um, yeah, let me throw it out to all of you. Anything jump out at anybody as interesting or what have you? Any comments or questions or ideas before we kind of start to move through it? But I'm just kind of curious if anything st stuck out at anybody. Well, let's start going through it then. So the first thing that we want to kind of notice is this initial simile of the cloth. And it's this analogy or the simile that the Buddha's using. And he's talking about basically like, you know, you could imagine if you had like a nice, you know, um, basically blank, but a kind of a white piece of cloth and you were gonna dye it a different color there's a way in which that color 
would come out if the cloth were sort of clean to begin with. But if the cloth is already kind of defiled in that way, then the dyeing isn't going to come out right. And so we get this difference between starting with a pure cloth and start, starting with a defiled cloth. Now, I actually don't want to forget this, so I'm going to actually say it now. I actually think there's a very interesting way to interpret this sutra. There's, a, I mean, there's a lot of different things going on in here, but since we've read the whole thing, I feel like I can share this with you. So we have this beginning analogy of the defiled cloth and the clean cloth being dyed, and it's, you know, whether blue or yellow or red or carmine, right? So you get these vivid, these vivid colors, right? And that's being applied to, again, either a clean cloth or a defiled cloth. And what you might not have noticed, because it actually took me a few readings before I was like, oh, at the end of the sutra, the Buddha is talking about a accomplished bhikkhu, so someone who has abandoned those 16 upakleshas. And the Buddha is talking about how somebody in such a state of concentration and such a state of wisdom they could eat alms food consisting of choice hill rice along with various sauces and curries. And that won't be an obstacle for them. The sauces and the curries sound very much like those colors from the opening. And the person, the bhikkhu, is the cloth that could potentially be defiled by this kind of fancy, savory food, which is what is being referenced by this choice hill rice with these savory curries. And the idea is, well, we can talk about it when we get to the end of the sutra, but I do want you to notice that, that those are like the bookends of the sutra, is the eating this nice food, but not being kind of defiled by it, and then the opening simile of the cloth. So that's our kind of initial reference point in that way. And then what's the analogy for? Well, the analogy is for a defiled mind. A chit so it's this chitasa upakilesa, a mind in imperfections that defile the mind. Once again, these are this sort of covetousness and unrighteous greed. That's like one idea. Now, what I want us to be thinking about here is, is like, let's, I want to give each of these a moment, <laughs> just a moment to land, a moment for us to think about them. And then I kind of want to talk about them all together, right? But this idea of this kind of unrighteous greed, or number two, ill will, or number three, anger, or resentment, contempt, insolence, envy, avarice, deceit, fraud, being obstinate, rivalry, conceit, arrogance, and vanity, and then negligence. So those are these 16 upakleshas that defile the mind. And that is sort of like a cloth that is defiled before being dyed. So a, a mind that is defiled by these 16 things. I really kind of want to focus on these, not individually, but as a, as a whole. And I want us to notice that like, like, first of all, notice for like, if you are, if you're familiar with like 
the precepts and you're familiar with general Buddhist morality, you'll notice there's nothing in here particularly about sexuality. There's nothing in here particularly about intoxication. There's not really anything in here about stealing, but there is a lot about the underlying causes of stealing in that way. So basically what I mean is, is like, let's really look at this list of 16 things and really think about what it would be like to have these or to not have them. <laughs> and the idea, of course, again, and we don't need to go through them individually, but what I would suggest doing, and because this is sort of my personal practice, it would be a sort of about looking at any one of these or looking at all of them and sort of really looking underneath each of them for, you know, what's what would be prompting that? What would be motivating that? And what I mean is, is for example, let's just take like the idea of like ill will, anger, resentment, right? It's kind of a cluster or a family of emotions there. But the idea here is, is that, well, actually, I'm going to tie this together. I'm going to tie this together into a little mini Dharma talk because I want to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit, but not really. It's, it's all right here. I'm skipping over to verse six and the Buddha talks about somebody who has gotten rid of these, who has severed these 16 things. They acquire unwavering confidence in the Dharma. They acquire unwavering confidence in the Buddha, unwavering confidence in the Dharma, unwavering confidence in the Sangha. But I want to just focus for a moment on this. They acquire unwavering confidence in the Dharma, which is well proclaimed by the Blessed One. Visible here and now, immediately effective. I want to talk about that because it's, I've sort of mentioned it before, probably in Dharma doors, but this sentiment, this idea that Buddhism, that the Dharma, the idea that it is visible here and now and effective immediately, that's something that drew me to Buddhism for much of the reason that even the Buddha talks about, which is that there's a lot of suttas or even sutras where the Buddha talks about other, you know, the Brahmins or other practitioners. And he kind of talks or points out how a lot of the things that they're promising happen down the road, <laughs> right? And it's kind of this idea of like, you know, oh, you know, your life sucks. Well, if you pray to God down the road, life will get better. That's like why you would do kind of be devotional in that way. It's like, yeah, you know, it sucks now, but down the road, you might be in heaven or it might be better if you pray. And there's a lot of religious traditions like this where the, the payoff is sort of down the road. And the Buddha always makes a point of saying, but what I'm teaching is visible here and now, immediately effective. And I want to kind of point at how that is totally true, like that it it's, yeah, that's how the Dharma works in that way. I've used this example of, a few times in the past, but I might not have used it this way. So I'm going to use my cup in that sense. So one of the things that I've talked about in the past is I've used my cup as an example of this idea of like clinging and like attachment to point out the relationship between clinging and attachment and suffering, you know, like the Four Noble Truths type stuff. Now, what I've used this as, uh, I've referenced this is the idea of this. I've mentioned that if I, am like, this is my cup, like, stay away. If I'm in that state of mind 
and somebody comes in, whoop, steals my cup. Anger, one of these upakleshas, anger or ill will could arise towards the person that stole the cup, right? Now, what I often use this as an example for is I then point out, if I am just using the cup, but I'm under no impression that it's mine, that I own it, if my mind is not attached to this, if somebody came and grabbed it and took away with it, it would be like, oh, there goes the cup. The point being that the suffering, the, the like, ah, my cup is arising from the attachment. Now I'm gonna use that exact same example, but I wanna point at something. So this will be a slightly different way of looking at that. If this is my cup that I own, that I'm attached to, if somebody were to come and steal it and take it away, I might get upset, especially if I were attached to it and thought I owned it in that way. So here I am, ah, I'm so angry and upset and full of ill will and resentment and all of these upaklesha. Now, the normal way that we think is, ah, I'm so upset because that person stole my cup. One way that I'm thinking, one way that my suffering could stop is if they brought the cup back. So they, the cup ran away, it got stolen, and I'm like, ah! But if something happened and they brought it back and they were like, oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Here, here's your cup. Oh, thank God. Woo, my cup. No more suffering. Okay, we're back. We're back. That's one way for the, quote, alleviation of suffering to happen. That's one way. But what I want you to notice is, is that that way, where it's like, they got to bring the cup back for me to not be suffering. Well, that's dependent upon them bringing my, the cup back which may or may not happen at some future time. But you know what? There's another way to end suffering immediately. And what it is, is that if the person steals the cup and I'm all upset, the moment I detach from that clinging ownership, the moment I stop doing that, no more suffering. And it's immediate. And you know what's even better about it being immediate? It's entirely in my ability to do that or not. Whereas the other way, I'm still like at the mercy of this person that stole my cup. Like I'm still dependent upon them getting, giving it back to me. Now, if you understand that, that idea of the visible right here, right now, immediacy of the Dharma, if you kind of understand why that is true in that sense, right? Then I want us to think about what's going on with anger and ill will. Because if you kind of think about it, so here I am with my, oh, my cup. I love my cup, right? And then this person comes and steals my cup and now the anger arises. But you know what's actually kind of going on there if you look deep underneath it? My thinking is if I get angry enough, they'll bring the cup back. That's what I'm thinking. Now, is that true? <laughs> I could probably get as angry as I possibly can. And it's probably not gonna bring the cup back. But what I've noticed personally about my own anger and ill will and all of that, I've noticed for myself personally, that it's kind of a form of magical thinking. It's almost kind of like 
it's like, ooh, if I get angry enough, what I wish will come true. And this person will bring the cup back, but I've got to get angry enough. And that's actually delusional. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Usually anger just produces more anger. It usually doesn't produce, you know, maybe in our parents, it produced kindness and sympathy, which is probably where the conditioning that getting angry gets me what I want. It probably starts in childhood that way. But the point is, is that there's kind of a go-to place, which is anger in order to get what I want. And it's what I'm suggesting we kind of think about tonight is, does it really work that way? <laughs> Do, like, has anger worked for you that way? It hasn't worked for me that way. Whereas I have noticed that the more I practice Dharma, in terms of not being attached to that cup, the less I'm suffering. And that's like working all the time. So I'm sort of done thinking anger's working and I'm totally into thinking Dharma works. So that's my little spiel on just a couple of the upakleshas here. We're, now I do wanna backtrack. I do wanna get to the uh, developing faith. Oh, thank you, Noam. Developing faith in Buddha Dharma Sangha. But any questions about what I just mentioned? Sort of so questions about the Upakleshas, any of those 16 things? Sort of anything dealing with that? Yeah, Lane. Not exactly a question, not at all a question. But I wanted to chime in that I have a similar experience, not with anger, but with worry. And I read something interesting that said people will develop like a superstitious belief that if I worry and then it doesn't happen, that means the worrying worked. I know. Yep. The worrying worked and the bad thing didn't happen. And I was like, well, I don't know if I've ever heard anything truer, you know, I mean, not true, but that we well, think it, is true. Indeed. Indeed. It is um, something I've noticed about myself that exact thing that it's almost um, what you would kind of technically call a fetish. So a fetish, by the way, not, we're not talking sexual fetish. We're talking in, in, um, in anthropology, they sometimes use the word fetish for like a rabbit's foot, like a, a luck, a good luck charm. And there's a way to use worry like a fetish where if I rub it enough, and then what Lane just said, which is truly insightful, is that idea of like, so when I worry and the thing doesn't happen, it's proof that my worrying worked. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. Good. Yeah, Robert. Great to see you. Oh. Uh, I'm unmuting. Um, it's uh, from one of your many uh, Dharma talks. Um, if you're lost in the woods, and then you don't care where you, you are, then you're not lost anymore. Excellent. Excellent, Robert. And I, and I did, by the way, want to um, extend my example, like when I was talking about the cup being stolen and the person could either bring it back or I could overcome what was causing the suffering to begin with. Robert's idea, example of being lost, or And then the moment you don't care where you're going, you're not lost. That's the exact same thing. And there's a variety of ways to, you could look at it. I won't belabor it too long, but Robert, good point. It, it, it's much more than just in terms of anger. It's all 16 of these, if not more. So, cool. All right. So now let's talk confidence. So I'm one of the things that I was really happy about is this no this so this is Bhikkhu Bodhi, so I was really happy when I was preparing for tonight. I was really happy that this particular translator Bhikkhu Bodhi, in verse five, where it says that the person the Bhikkhu the practitioner, who has cut off abandoned all these things. It says that they acquire, and I do have words to say about acquire, but they acquire unwavering confidence 
in the Buddha. Now, in other translations, this would be acquiring faith in the Buddha and faith in the Dharma and faith in the Sangha. Now, the word that is being translated as either confidence or faith is this, in Sanskrit at least, is this term shraddha. And the thing about shraddha is that, yes, it, it can be translated as like faith, but I prefer either confidence or certainty. Similar to confidence, but a kind of certainty. And the way that I kind of express how I understand shraddha, confidence or faith or certainty in Buddhism, in Buddhism, shraddha, as far as it means faith, is never blind faith. It's never the idea of just believing. It's In fact, it's quite the opposite. It is about certainty. So not kind of just blind faith, but an actual knowing, and that's why you're certain. So for example, I just mentioned the Four Noble Truths, which is essentially this teaching about craving and clinging, producing suffering, but then this good news, which is that if you don't cling, don't crave, no suffering. That's the basis of the Four Noble Truths. Now, you might hear that and think, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe my suffering's being caused by my craving and clinging, but it might be being caused by other things. I'm, I'm not exactly sure about that, Buddha. <laughs> I'm not sure about your Dharma, Buddha. I'm not sure about what your Sangha is practicing Buddha. But then it might happen, I know that it happened for me, where I realized, oh, yeah, craving and clinging is producing all my suffering. I, I Yeah, that's right. And at that point, I had certainty or confidence in the Dharma. Like, it was, it was as clear as day that that is exactly what's going on, that that's sort of, that's right. And that would be what I consider a kind of shraddha, confidence, or certainty. It's a kind of knowing, oh yeah, this is, this is right. Or I love the way that they, what the way the sutra describes this faith, which is to say confidence in the sangha. Oh yeah. The, the Buddha and his disciples, what they're doing, that's, that's the good way. That's the straight way. That's the true way. That's the way. So that would be this kind of certainty or confidence that the Eightfold Path or you know the Buddha way is the way, that what the Buddha taught is true. That's like, that stuff's true. And... The first of them is developing this sort of faith or confidence or certainty in the state of an awakened being. This is an important one, or yeah, it's important, but it's interesting. And what this one is, or what how I think of this one, there's a certain degree, there can be a certain degree of doubt or uncertainty about whether the alleviation of suffering is actually possible. Can a human being actually reach this state? If you're on the fence about that, meaning, eh, you know, I think well, maybe you could like improve, <laughs> but like actually ending suffering and like, act I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know if such a state of human being is possible. That would not be having confidence or faith in the Buddha. It, 
the way that I understand that it, it is not about um, faith in the historical person and not faith in them as some sort of guru. It's about a, a belief, a faith or a confidence that such a state of human liberation is possible. And that like somebody did it and we called them Buddha. And what I want you to kind of notice is or think about is if you are, if you're not totally certain that such a state of human being is possible, it that very doubt, and by the way, doubt is not again, it's not this religious doubt of like whatever. It's just like not being certain about that. But if you're not certain about that Buddha state being possible, I want you to notice how that might obstruct or kind of stymie developing such a state <laughs> if you don't even think such a state is possible. And it might be hard to sort of get into the Dharma if you're not really certain or confident that it's true to a certain degree. And it might be hard to have faith in the Sangha, especially if you're basically like a hedonist. Meaning if if all if you believe that the per, if the point of life is to maximize pleasure, then renouncing the 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 household life and joining a sangha would seem like sit that would be dumb because life is about maximizing pleasure. But if you have confidence in the Dharma and confidence in the Buddha, then it has this kind of confidence in the lifestyle of the Sangha. So questions about Shraddha, faith or confidence or certainty in Buddha, Dharma or Sangha? Yeah, no. Um, I feel like I'm not sure you said this or implied it or yeah is can one have <laughs> if one has faith in the dharma um as a a, a path that alleviates suffering that 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 lessens suffering with without believing that there's without i guess in your words having faith in the buddha meaning sort of believing that there's a state that one could get to let's say that one like actually in this life could get to a complete alleviation of suffering is are are you saying that's sort of not having faith <laughs> you know what i do you, do you understand what i'm saying like yeah, and, you know, faith or confidence in the Buddha is not entirely traditionally what I said. I, I And I did preface it by the, the, the way that I understand it is that it's about sort of faith in that human potential versus faith, like faith in a human being, a specific human being. But in some Buddhist traditions, it is specifically a faith that there like really was this historical person that walked the earth that taught this stuff. And it wasn't just a fiction. Yeah. That is an, one aspect of faith. But for me, that doesn't like, for me personally, that doesn't do anything mm -hmm. like, you know, faith that there was a historical figure versus faith in human potential. I lean towards, and now, you know, I'm talking, I guess, more about our hot status, maybe not Buddha status, Although I do believe in Buddha status too, but again, this is all very confessional on my part about mm -hmm. my type of Buddhism. But so I don't know if that answered or said anything. No, but oh, it's just something I debate a lot for myself. Ah, uh, sure. I mean, I'm guess I'm asking a personal question too, and I'm I'm sort of asking just to, not about the historical Buddha so much, but whether whether having faith that the path will alleviate my suffering some is, uh, mm. is, is a legitimate 
faith versus having faith that it will completely alleviate it. Yeah. You know. So Something. on on that note, I did want to say that for me, the, I, this idea of certainty or faith or confidence is very personal, meaning nobody else ever gets to say whether somebody has faith or confidence or not. You know or you don't. And on that note, Noam, I would say then it's whatever you have faith in. So if you have faith or confidence that the Dharma alleviates some suffering or you know what have you, and that you have faith in that, then the idea is, is that it could give you that then because you kind of have faith that it could deliver that. But the point is, is that if you don't have faith that it can deliver that, it's going to be hard for it to deliver that for you. That's sort of my main point about the, the mechanics of faith. On that note, because it comes up so much and I don't talk about it enough, I feel like in a way, Dharma teachers in general don't talk about it enough. In the world of Buddhism, there is this language of acquisition. You acquire faith. You acquire samadhis. You acquire samapati, meaning uh, spiritual attainments. You acquire the siddhis the spiritual superpowers. So there's this language about acquiring. And it's tricky language because they don't, of course, mean that there's an object that you are getting and that you could like put in your purse or what have you. I think faith is a really good thing to just like to use as a case example, I was just, I had mentioned a kind of my personal, um, or I had condensed it, but I, of course, had a relationship with Buddhism or the Dharma for years and years and years before I had faith in it. I, you know, I, I taught it kind of academically, but I also taught Taoism. I was interested in Christianity, so I was sort of still trying to figure out like, you know, which, what's a good practice? What, you know, what is helpful? But then I had this kind of moment where I was like, oh, wow. And, you know, it's mainly this kind of teaching of no self and not attaching to drishtis, not attaching to views. But that, those ideas, I was like, oh, wow. Everybody else is trying to get me attached to a view. <laughs> All these other traditions are just reinforcing the delusion of self. This dharma is, I think it's true or that what have you. And you could say in that moment, I acquired faith in the dharma. But did I, did I get anything? Like, but something happened. There was a transition from not having such shraddha to having that. So however you think of that and what whatever happens there where you acquire certainty, well, that's acquiring. And in Buddhism, you can acquire samadhis, merit, superpowers, all kinds of things in that way. So, Maria. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw this in uh, in case it's useful for anyone. When we were talking about the analogy of the raft, um, I thought that that was um, a really good way to think about the development of faith and particularly the aspect of piecing it together from sticks and twigs. Mm. And, um, you know, you really have to kind of uh develop that confidence or faith before you have um kind of a, a seaworthy vessel <laughs> to you know traverse so. beautiful sentiment absolutely 
Okay. So the next sort of section of this, after we develop our unwavering faith, um, let's see. Ah, the next section that I wanted to talk about begins with, um, oh, actually, I, really quickly, I did want to mention regarding these upaklesha, these 16 mental defilements, the the language that's used is this specific language of of severing and you know we, we don't need to talk too much about it but buddhism is always or the buddha is always using what i would call horticultural metaphors of like the garden and so he the buddha sometimes talks about these defilements as being like weeds or like um, uh, vines that strangle you. And so there's this language of extirpation, like digging way down under the soil and cutting things off at the root. And that's the language that's actually being used here is that type of severing or cutting. And I just wanted to mention that because if you... Well, for example, if you're familiar with the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, it's actually called the Vajra Cutter Pranyaparamita Sutra. And the metaphor of cutting is this idea of severing, which is this horticultural metaphor of digging way down and cutting off at the root. So, one who has done that. So when one has given up, expelled, released, abandoned, and relinquished these imperfections of the mind, they consider thus. So they have this thought. I am possessed of unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And then when they realize that they have confidence in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, they gain inspiration in artaha, in meaning. They gain inspiration in the Dharma and they gain a gladness connected with the Dharma. And when they're glad, pretty rapture arises or rapture is born. In one who is rapturous, the body becomes prashrabhi, becomes tranquil. In one whose body is tranquil, one feels sukkaha, one feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated in samadhi. So that progression of moving from, and I want us to like kind of walk through that really quickly. So we've learned about these 16 upakleshas, ill will, all these terrible things. And the Buddha's talking about if you get rid of those, it might so happen that there arises or that you acquire this sort of faith in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And then from acquiring such faith in the Buddha, in the Dharma, and the Sangha, this sort of inspiration takes place in which one becomes gladdened in connection with the Dharma. Now, I, I want to like kind of focus on this or just like sort of touch upon it. But, you know, I tried to give a good Dharma talk earlier a good kind of rousing Dharma talk to get us to consider the, the lack of benefit to ill will, anger, resentment, and so on, right? So the idea here is, is that if I did my job well, and you started this, and maybe you thought, nah, you know, maybe every now and then anger's good. Maybe a little rivalry is good. Maybe a little arrogance is good. But upon deeper reflection, if I was maybe convincing and you were like, you know what? 
all of those 16 things are nasty mind defilements. I don't want any of those in my mind. There's a way in which from that, you might develop this sort of confidence or faith in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And then at that point, the Dharma, like its very existence would make you glad. And I don't know, I had a day, I, I had a day where I was thinking a lot about these 16 things. I was seeing a lot of these 16 things in the world, seeing a lot of arrogance and ill will floating about. And when I was getting ready for this Dharma talk tonight, and I thought about a world without those 16 things, when I thought about a mind without those 16 things, it made me happy. Like the very idea of, of that. Uh, and especially even the idea of being without all of those. That made me happy or glad. So that's sort of an inspiration in the Dharma. From that gladness or being inspired by the Dharma, this rapture could arise. This rapturous bliss could arise from the gladness in the Dharma and from the rapturous bliss, this kind of tranquility, and from this tranquility, a kind of pleasure. And then from that pleasure, samadhi. And in terms of, well, how, how exactly do we get, how do, exactly do we get from delighting in the Dharma to samadhi, like a deep meditative state of concentration. Well, what comes before it, of course, is this pleasure, which comes from the tranquility, which comes from the rapture, which comes from the gladness in the Dharma. But what I want you to notice or think about is we always, or I always think about, I always think about not how do I get into a samadhi? I actually always think about what is keeping me out of samadhi? And so when I sit down to meditate, I notice if there's this sort of like, you know, a desire to be entertained, a desire to eat, a desire, you know, whatever it is. And noticing that, oh, well, it's this inclination and this desire and then in the context of this sutra, it could also be kind of being anxious or full of ill will or full of any of these things. And then the idea is, is that, oh, yeah, if I weren't pissed off all the time, if I weren't kind of so worked up all the time, and why weren't all those things all the time, there would sort of not be that outward inclination to grasp at sounds, flavors, smells, and what have you. And so from a kind of, um, uh, what do they call that in, in Ashtanga? The, uh, is it Pratyahara? The withdrawing of, Pratyahara, right? The withdrawing of the senses. So normally the senses are fully flared out. <laughs> But pratyahara, this Ashtanga yoga term of turning the senses inward. And the idea is, is by doing that, the mind is then not stirred outward. And then what the Buddhists talk about, of course, is this priti, this rapturous bliss that arises from being independent, from not needing anything to be pleased. Normally, again, we need to be watching something to be delighted, or we need to be eating something to be delighted, or touching somebody or something to be delighted. And there's this deeper pleasure or rapture that comes actually from not needing anything for pleasure. And I would call that sovereignty or independence. And that for me is the, how you get from this sort of like, wow, the Dharma is so great. All my attachments are causing all my suffering. <laughs> and so from a delighting in the truth of that Dharma, 
it can produce this rapture from being independent, which then can kind of even out into a kind of tranquility and then settle down to just an utter pleasure. And then, boom, you're locked in in samadhi because you don't need anything, you don't want anything, you're totally content as you are in that sense. So that's my little kind of understanding of that section moving all the way to samadhi. And then the person in such a state of wisdom and samadhi brought about by getting rid in part of those 16 mental defilements, that's where we are then brought back full circle to this idea that such a practitioner could eat savory, fancy alms food, and it wouldn't be an obstacle to them. Now, if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote regarding this section, the commentarial tradition, and I don't always appeal to the commentarial tradition, but you know I really respect Bhikkhu Bodhi. In the commentarial section, what they are saying is, is that I think it's a, what is it, a, a once returner, maybe even a non-returner. So a non-returner, non-returners in the in the rubric of stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arahat. The non-returner, if you reach that state, you again, according to the footnote, you eradicate sensual desire. You no longer have this sort of addictive desirous mentality and so what the illusion is is you wouldn't get addicted to the fancy savory food it wouldn't be an obstacle whereas if somebody hasn't eradicated these things if they get some yummy food the next time they get not yummy food they're going to have a problem with it and they're going to want the yummy food again and so having had the yummy food will become an obstacle Whereas for the bhikkhu or the practitioner who has reached the state that we're talking about, there is the eradication of that. And so being exposed to fancy stuff is not an obstacle. So, And then the sutra moves into a beautiful loving kindness or Brahma Vihara, kind of the four immeasurable mind states meditation, where the practitioner imbues all four directions and above and below and all around and everywhere, extending out to every sentient being as if they are ourselves, loving kindness, great compassion, empathic joy, and finally equanimity. All right, and then that sort of concludes the main kind of part of the sutra. But then it shifts into this interesting, like second part. And in some traditions, this sutra is known as the Sundarika Bahara Devaja Sutra, the, the name of the Brahman that we are about to talk about. But what prompts this is the Buddha's upaya. The upaya is when he gives this discourse, he gives this dharma talk all about getting rid of the upakleshas, developing faith in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, and thereby acquiring samadhi. And in that samadhi, we imbue all directions with loving kindness, <laughs> compassion, empathic joy, and equanimity. And then the Buddha says that practice, or this, I should say, he says that this discourse on that practice is called being bathed with inner bathing. And the idea is, is that the Buddha happened to have in the audience a bunch of Brahmins who were led 
by this guy, Sundarika Baharadavaja, who was basically a Baptist, meaning he believed in uh, ritual purification using sacred river waters. And this Sundarika Baharadavaja is, again, the leader of a group of Brahmins who were doing ritual absolutions or whatever that fancy word is, otherwise known as baptisms. And so knowing that these Brahmins were interested in ritual bathing, the Buddha makes this kind of funny, uh, it's not a joke, but it's this kind of, um, he's basically kind of, He's saying this to get a, a reaction out of Sundarika Baharadavaja. And so he says, yeah, this teaching that I've just given you is called being bathed in inner bathing. So that's where Sundarika Baharadavaja says, Buddha, Gotama, you don't go to the sacred rivers to bathe. And by bathing, of course, we don't mean taking a bath we mean this kind of ritual purification process. So Sundarika is saying, hey, Buddha, you don't go to the sacred rivers to, to purify yourself? And the Buddha says, what are the rivers going to do for you? And then recites this poem about all of these different sacred rivers, Bahuka, Adikaka, Gaya, Sundarika, Hayaga Sarasati, and the stream Bahumati. He says only a fool will, a fool could bathe there forever and not get rid of or purify their dark deeds, right? And then, well, and then the second stanza is, you know, also what can all of those sacred rivers bring to pass? But he says, one pure in heart has evermore the feast of spring. And it's a, a specific kind of holy day called uh, Pahagu, the holy day. So one pure in heart has evermore the feast of spring, the holy day. One fair in act, one pure in heart brings virtue to perfection. And then the Buddha says, it's here in the heart that you should bathe to make yourself a refuge for all beings. And then he gives a quick kind of summary of the precepts, not lying, not killing, not stealing, and being free from avarice. Why, do you, why would you need to go to Gaia? Any well will be your Gaia well. So this is a very interesting conclusion to the sutra. And what I mean is, is that I've mentioned this before. I've, you know, I was, I was talking about this maybe, I don't know, a couple of sutras ago. A couple of sutras ago, we got to talking about how and why the gods come to the Buddha with questions. And I was trying, or I was, I was stressing like how radical of a message that is. Like it, it really, I feel like needs to be appreciated that within a world of like religious devotion to deities, to completely flip that and say, yeah, but a Buddha, even the gods will bow before a Buddha. That's like a radical theological statement. What might be even more radical is this, which is basically saying to all the people that are bathing themselves in the Ganges River for purification, the Buddha is basically saying that is useless if you're not pure within in that sense. And so the Buddha, this whole sutra, has given the prescription for how to develop this kind of actual inner purity, bathed in inner bathing, 
he calls it, right? And then, and, you know, I mentioned baptism earlier. It's a practice. People are into it. And the reason why I actually wanted to make a kind of a reference to, like, I guess you would call it the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, because I'm not specifically just talking about Christianity, because there's a practice of ritual purification in Judaism, especially the more ancient monastic traditions like the Essenes and all of that. So there's like a culture of ritual baptism. But interestingly, with at least within both the Christian and Jewish traditions, there's a relationship with that purification with a spring ritual, Pasach, right? Passover or Easter in that way. This is a very interesting line that one pure in heart, it, every day is Easter, <laughs> is basically what that line is saying. And that's, or, or like every day is the holy day. So both of those, the idea that any, you know, any river is holy if you are pure inside in that way. So that idea and the idea that if you are sort of pure of heart, every day is a holiday or a holy day in that sense. It's a radical statement. I mean, ag against certain kinds of religious activity. And it's not unlike the Buddha to basically say what you're doing is useless in that way. Like he's kind of, he he's one to tell people that what they're doing is either delusional or useless in that sense. So, all right. And then of course, uh, Sundarika Bahara Devaja is, he's sold, he's convinced. And so he basically puts down his uh, ritual bathing Brahmin ways and becomes a fully ordained monk only shortly after which to become an arhat. And that's the sutra. So anything, any questions or ideas or comments about that last part, about the ba the ritual bathing? Cool. All right, well then that's gonna conclude yet another sutra. We did it. Michael, I do have a, a bit of a question. Yeah, please. Uh, what, how is that last section connected to the rest of the sutra? The whole sutra is about purification. The whole sutra is about being defiled versus right. being pure. Right, right, right. And we've got a few different things going on. We've got the, the simile of the cloth. Right. But then the, what the Buddha is saying is that real purification is mental purification from things like being angry, full of ill will and resentment. Mm -hmm. He's saying that's actual purification. And what he's basically saying, if I were to read between the lines, he was saying that if you're full of anger, you could go to the Bahuka River and bathe all you want. And it's not going to do anything in that way for, you know, in that sense. So Robin, you have a question? Uh, or, yes. It's interesting the use of the word stain because stain is so um, in a way it's kind of permanent. It, it alters it, it, you know, it really, it's it's almost seems so permanent. Does that do you think that's used because it shows the you know, the true power? I mean, it's not just some dirt that's gotten on the cloth. It's been stained. I would I hear you, but I would actually I sort of look at it diff, the opposite. And what I mean by that is what I have what I always appreciate about the Buddhist tradition and a sutra like this is, especially if you read 
if you happen to be able to like really read the original language, it talks about the mind. And uh, let me try to get the this exact language. But it's about this mind. So it's about these imperfections that defile the mind or stain in that way. And what's important about that is that the or the implication as is that the mind naturally is enlightened or perfect or pure or fine or whatever and there's some thing i would call it it's not endemic to the mind but it's something that gets in there and we kind of need to get it out or the stain needs to be removed but the important part about that message is that the mind that's there underneath it is fine just the way it is Whereas in some traditions, there's kind of more of an idea of a fundamental flaw that is is endemic, that is not just an accident. It's like part of your kind of spiritual makeup. But in Buddhism, the defilement is not part of your natural state. Yeah, so truly a good insight or a good, yeah, good question about the nature of that stain. All right, so then on that note, let's call it a night and we will proceed to a next another sutra next Sunday. Cool. Oh, by the way, real quick, uh, Noam, I'm just gonna, if you don't mind. Um, so you may know that next weekend is the Lunar New Year. So the kind of the Asian Lunar New Year. It's going to be the year of the wood dragon coming in. So long to the rabbit, welcoming the dragon. Um, and on Saturday morning, so next Saturday morning from nine to nine to noon California time, I'm going to be doing a presentation on Buddhist ideas of time to kind of go along with the Lunar New Year. And so we're going to talk about kind of all things time related in buddhism so that's about like talking about the shortest measurements of time the longest measurements of time what is time is there time so all these kind of different questions explored from a buddhist point of view uh and so that's a presentation again next saturday february 10th 9 to noon and if you're interested you can go to my website lotusunderground.com and find out more and see how to be a part of it so Thank you for listening. And as usual, thanks for being here. Appreciate seeing you so much.